And there we go. We are live. Welcome to the Tavern Chat Podcast. This is uh, basically a fireside chat with none other than Jeff Jones. Uh, if you are a frequenter of the Tavern, you probably know Jeff as the layout artist for Torchlight. It wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Jeff. But it's far from the only project that Jeff has behind him and in front of him. So, Jeff, welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me. You are very welcome. So now, and we actually discussed this in the past briefly, but remarkably enough, uh, Jeff and I not only share the same date of birth, the same year of birth, we we are basically brothers from other parents, but it is it is a re- rare synergy to find that. You know, I actually did see my, my body double one time uh, in Manhattan. I made me do double take because I thought I saw myself walking down the street and Normally, you don't have that self-awareness, but it is very it, – it's fun to, to share a date of birth with somebody. So that's pretty cool. Thank you. So now, how did you get into this 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 hobby of ours? What what was your gateway drug to gaming? Yeah, so I, I'm trying to think back. I think it was back in the 70s with the, uh, the blue box. So is that the mold bay? I get, sorry, I get confused all the different terms. What was the blue box with the Earl Otis? Oh, okay, yeah, I think – yeah, the, the, so you, you, we had basic, basic expert, and then we had uh, whatever. Uh, keeping the borderlands with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I was like in eighth grade, so or seventh grade, so that was the start. So it was just a matter of, uh, and, I, and I can't even remember how it was first picked up. I'm assuming it must have been at a B. Dalton bookstore or something. Yeah, you know, for a lot of us, B. Dalton's is where we we bought a lot of our initial gaming material because they, I mean, it was it was ca- carried in a major bookstore. It was right there by the fantasy. You could actually find one or two sets of dice, and uh, you know, current issues of Dragon Magazine. That 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 was my go-to place. Yeah, it was strange at the time. I didn't really have anybody to to play this with. So, um, other than maybe a few occasional people, I kind of course into so it was really kind of and i wish i could think back to what it was like trying to understand the rules i know a lot of people can remember trying to parse the rules when they're in high school or grade school but i don't really quite remember that but i do remember trying to run some sessions and them not going too well but eventually in high school got a hold of some friends who were interested and we started an informal gaming group and we just played from there really yeah see for me I was introduced by my friend Kenny, I guess, in in seventh grade to AD and D, and he didn't have the player's handbook, so uh, we did a one on one. He had the he had the DMG, and he had to call a friend, and you can make those phone calls quick because it was ten point six cents, I think, for the first five minutes, and then ten point six cents afterwards. We had to call to see if I leveled up, and I then I when I got the books, my mother gave them to me for my birthday. I had the player's handbook and the DMG. It didn't have the Munster manual. I didn't know what HD stood for. I thought HD and HP were the same thing. So my ogres all had four plus one hit points, five. My players were tearing through shit left and right. <laughs> and I think that's what's kind of uh, wonderful about those days. We were terrible with the rules. Uh, yes. We would be attracted with to all sorts of like complicated systems that – now we look at and think this makes no sense, but I think we're just so in love with the game, so in love with the rules. And it was such heady stuff that we would go through and try and figure out, you know, rolling all these crazy treasure types. And- oh God, yeah. I, I would spend, uh, you know, like Thanksgiving at my uh, my aunt's house, and I would just take my DMG and roll out random dungeons on the on the floor as all the adults were adulting. I didn't want to. Be any part of that crap so you know i thought you ever tried building castles and then going through the costs and telling them up i did once and uh it was an act of futility i mean even running ma- like mass combat before before the battle system came out and i and i'm not a fan of battle system but i had to like create my own mass combat rules because my players wanted you know, they were all name level they wanted to conquer land and it wound up being the wild coast, 
And my original Greyhawk maps still have the grease pencil remains because apparently grease pencil on the Greyhawk maps doesn't work very well. It just <laughs> mirrors all gray. But uh, yeah, we you know we didn't call it house ruling back then, but we did a, a lot of that. Yeah, and how you have those misunderstandings of rules, and then after you go through maybe a year or two, you go back and you think, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one of the things we did early on and thought were pretty clever was the um, with the weapon speeds. Oh, I, we I we, we couldn't even comprehend. We tried that and segment. Weapon speeds were gone first session. Segments lasted a, a, a summer. What we did is we took a, a D10 to roll for initiative. And then you would just keep adding your weapon speed. And so, oh. well, what ended up happening is if you're a monk, you end up hitting somebody about 10 times before a somebody with two-handed sword could actually swing. That's kind of like how uh, Hackmaster 5e does it, I think. Or so something related to that. I I have the basic Hackmaster basic rules, and I haven't read them in years. So I'm, But I've heard people that are Hackmaster fans talk about how the initial system takes into account weapon speed and it's a count up system. Uh, I still have confusion over in AD and D first edition, how a dagger fighting two handed sword is one attack each, unless you have a tied initiative, in which case the dagger attacks like 90 billion times before the two handed sword. I, and then how that comes into effect with multiple attacks of higher level fighters, I, I don't know. I still scratch my head. That's why I, I gravitate now toward simpler systems like Swords and Wizardry and, and Labyrinth Lord. You know, I, I don't need that complication like, like, like you were alluding to. I mean, I loved running Middle Earth role playing and uh, Role Master back in the day. Uh, uh, now affectionately referred to, I guess, as chart system or chart master, but uh, I, I, I don't have it in me. Well, I think with those systems, what you have are games within games, and that was the fun part, right? Right. So if you open up the DMG, there are so many games within the game. So you could, you know, hirelings. That's a game within a game. Building your castle is a game within a game. Building up treasure types a game within a game. All those are systems that <clears throat> are embedded into the game. But as we get older, we we don't want all that. We just want to get to the story, right? We just want to get right to the fun part. We're not oh, necessarily yeah. interested in what exactly are the gemstones for this treasure? Oh, God. <laughs> right. And then you got to, and after you figured that out, then you got to roll the value. But yeah. that's just like, oh, geez. And then, of course, there were no really built-in rules, though, for determining if you knew the value of what you had. There was no, you know, the appraisal rules were all these optional rules that you would, you or homegrown rules you would see in Dragon Magazine or, or White Dwarf or some other place. Oh, God. Yeah, you're, you're bringing back memories. But again, like I said, we never called it house rules. Even if we changed stuff around, you know, house ruling is a terminology I, I didn't experience until I, I came back to gaming. Yeah, you know, with old school, with the OSR. Well, did you play with the same group for like your high school years? My high school, I played with two groups. Um, I I had a a high school group, and then I had my Pennsylvania group. So my parents had a house in the Poconos, so if we went up to the Poconos for the weekend, I had a group of players up in the Poconos. But in both cases, if we played D and D or A D and D, I was the GM. I I DM'd. Other systems, maybe yes, maybe no, but the 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 feeling, especially here in New York, with my gaming group, was uh, yeah, no, only Eric is qualified to run D and D, uh, so only Eric runs it. So I I think I played like in my in my teenage years, I think I played two sessions of uh, of uh, second edition, and uh, everything else was was as a as a game master, but I played. Rifts, Palladium, played and and ran uh, Middle Earth, but uh, really when it came to to D and D, I, I was only a game master. And up in PA, it was a steady steady group for the summers or for uh, the weekends that lasted through high school. Didn't last into college because then all my friends either joined the military or went away to college. So uh, that group withered, but. 
you know, the high school group continued. So what percentage of your games would you say were D&D games, whatever edition? Um, you know, you look at high school, you know, when you're in, in it for, you know, solid. Init initially 100% until my budget kind of got a little bit further. And I, I loved buying games. So I had all the pace setter games, chill, time master, uh, Space Ace or Star Ace, whatever it was Star called. Star Ace, yeah. I even, I even uh, uh, did a demo with the with the the writer of Star Ace at a local convention. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, Star Ace. Uh, I still remember. Uh, I, I believe that somebody's ship blew up, but they they themselves were unharmed and floating in space. And I think that's when my players were like, "We got to try a different game." <laughs> I ran. I ran Role Master and Space Master. Uh, had a great campaign of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. So let's go back to Role Master and Space Master. So yeah. I ran. I think to me, it seemed like Role Master worked better for me when we ran than Space Master. I don't think we really played very long. Uh, Space, Space Master. Master I, I ran that with a group, and we only had, uh, I think, two or three of the original group that were still steady for a while until others came back to the group. And we ran Space Master because. It was a system that we could get away from the fantasy tropes, and you didn't D and D, as you well know. If you don't cover all your bases, your class wise, your your party is hindered. And uh, with a game like Role Master or Space Master, even though it's class based, you can take skills outside of your class. Right. And and Space Master seemed to be less restrictive uh, class wise. Than the fantasy games. Fantasy games, you always needed a healer. You needed a tank. You needed an arcane spellcaster. Space Master, you just needed people to kill shit and fly ships. Everything else was optional. So, so for Role Master, did you, what brought you to that? Did you, were you attracted to the system first or were you attracted to the modules first? Attracted to the, the Middle Earth modules. I think uh, Angmar or something like that was the first one I picked up. So did you ever run those in D&D, &D, or did you always run them with the system? Initially, we ran them with Rollmaster, and then I got Merp uh, 1E, and we ran it with Merp, but using the critical tables from uh, Rollmaster. So originally, we ran it using D&D, &D, but we didn't understand the way the spells worked. And so you get like Haste 2 or Haste 5 or Haste 10. Right. We misunderstood that and thought it was haste times ten or haste times five. Oh, nice! Yeah. So anyway, so sometimes you'd get a, a, a potion or a, something that allowed you to one time a day, both for us and the bad guys, and it would turn into something completely ugly really quick. So, I mean, it, it's funny because I look back now on like Middle, Middle Earth role playing, and it was a, a great setting. And it was a good system, but it was a bad system for that setting. Oh yes, it was. It was not Lord of the Rings, that's for sure. Yeah, and it's like it, even like the handful of adventures that you could pick up for it. I mean, I'm not talking the setting adventures, but like uh, the ones that were written like a traditional D and D adventure, where the you know uh, those. Were literally written like a D and D adventure set in Middle Earth, and it really wasn't the same feel. Right when you had the prevalence of magic items and spellcasters. I mean, oh, like everywhere like, spellcasters in that game, yeah. especially because pretty much every character class could take spellcasting. So once you got to like beyond that beginning level of play, everybody had some kind of spell like ability because they were putting points into it. And therefore, uh, any NPCs the party came across generally had it. And it's like, this doesn't really feel like Tolkien's world, where you could count the people that, you know, in the books that were able to invoke magic on on, on one hand and, and maybe an extra finger or two. Right. So, yeah, that was a problem. But still, it, it was fun until uh, we realized... Uh, pretty quickly, that as much fun as those critical tables were to inflict on your enemies, they had long-term effects on the players. Oh, your yeah. enemies are one and done. They're yeah. meant to fall away. But those critical effects on PCs were 
were really detrimental. Yeah, but I think in the day, I mean, I think as uh, being older, I look at it that way. But I think back in high school, we loved that. We didn't care. Oh, we 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 loved it for the first, I don't know, three four months of the campaign, and <laughs> right. then it became. Uh, now, not being said, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay had uh, criticals, but they weren't as as, as literally party stopping as the ones in uh, in Rollmaster. Uh, and I did. A, we actually spent a whole summer playing uh, RuneQuest Second Edition when I picked it up at a gaming convention over at uh, Columbia University. That Pavis and Big Rubble, and I just ran it as an open sandbox, not even knowing what a sandbox was, but I ran it as an open sandbox for uh, two and a half months of so did gameplay you use the three or four times a week. RuneQuest. What's up? Or did you did you use the actual RuneQuest? I think Rampa. Or did you just use it as a generic or a generic uh, fantasy? No, we used it in Glorantha. Now, my problem with RuneQuest is that I initially got uh, RuneQuest Third Edition, the Avalon Hill version, which really wasn't all that great. And when you oh, you felt like you were going to destroy the books just by reading them because the paper was it was oh. it remind, yeah. I mean the, the so. But when I found RuneQuest 2, we fell in love with it. It just it when it was as complicated as we we needed. We could run things pretty loose. But we, we again we would focus on a game for a couple of months and then go back to D and D, and then focus on a new game for a couple of months and then go back to D and D. We always had paranoia for when we weren't in the mood to play anything serious. You know. It, we 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 had a, a, a plethora of of games to choose from. How many GMs did you have? Uh, two, me as the primary, and my friend Dave as the secondary. And Dave never ran D and D because he he never wanted to be compared to me when it came to running the D and D session. So he'd run Rifts, he'd run Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but. Or or something else, but he maybe even Star Wars, but he would never run D and D or AD and D. So yeah, that's kind of interesting. I think it's probably why to you it didn't feel sand or like um, uh, you said house ruling, because there were your rules, right? So it wasn't yep. like you had a different set of rules for Bob and a different set of rules for you. Whatever the rules were, you decided were the rules that were going to be. I think that's a good way to look at it. I, I never even uh, thought about it that way, but you're right. Even uh, our college group, which uh, lasted for, I don't know, two or three years, um, even even our college group really only had me as the uh, as the GM. So yeah, we had. We, if it was being house ruled, it was being house ruled in my head, and these are the rules we're running with. You're right. So when you're younger, did you worry about continuity? Like, did you have a world and every event should tie together? Or did you just run things as kind of episodic and whatever it was, whatever it was? Um, I thought I was running things coherently, but no, I wasn't. It was episodic. It was whatever came out of Dungeon Magazine. You uh, know, I, yeah, it's like, oh, we got Dungeon Magazine. I got five new adventures. I don't feel like writing one. Let's see which one we'll plug in next. So All right. You, you're there. Yeah. So now, now that you're older, do you do you want to have it tied together? Do you run longer campaigns, or do you just run more episodic as you're older? Um, I have run both ways, and I'll, I plan on kicking a campaign off uh, beginning of the year, and it's going to be episodic. But it's going to be episodic mostly because I envision it more as a drop in, drop out type of game run via roll twenty and. Uh, and Discord, so uh, I don't expect to always have the same group back and forth, so episodic works. And I enjoyed running a, an episodic campaign of sorts uh, using the DCC RPG adventures, but with the Swords and Wizardry rules. So finish off the adventure. Well, we, we break for a couple of weeks, come back, and all right, so over the last you know couple of weeks, this is what happened, yada, yada, yada. And now, boom, back into the action. But I've run when I came back. I I ran a, a long campaign using uh, Black Marsh, Tim Conley's setting. 
And it was fun. It was a sandbox. And uh, certainly not episodic because I generally didn't know what the fuck was going to happen. So, but... So the, yeah. the games uh, now, are you playing in any games or do you mainly just run games? Um, the last game uh, I ran, I actually, the last game I was playing, it was Tim Schwartz's campaign, which was a lot of fun. That was though back in uh, 2019, 2020. Uh, I ran a session at uh, TotalCon in February. And then I had the year from fucking hell. I mean, we've all had a year from hell in 2020 with COVID. I just had the uh, trifecta of hospitalization, so it it was. I, and I ran another uh, game day for uh, Frog God in the fall, and that was a lot of fun. Great group of people. But uh, I, I I find these days, um, I am I'm, I'm a better GM than I am a player. Uh, and I don't know necessarily why that is, but. I and I go to conventions. I don't play as a player at all. I'm um, I'm running games, or I'm socializing, or I'm helping running the frog guy table. It, you know, I'm I'm there more to socialize on that level than I am to game. Let's take a find a new game to play. See, that's what I would do at conventions. I would play new systems. I don't like don't need to play the ones I've already played at a convention. That's what you know groups are for that are steady. Yeah, and that's pretty much what I do. I mean, I like to either find games I, either old games that I have never played, or old games I played for nostalgia. Like I would love to play Champions. I was really hoping to do that at um, a game hole I got killed because I've not played Champions. And well, oh, I game. haven't. I haven't played Champions. I think I was uh, eighteen the last time I played Champions, and uh, even then we were remarking, "Wow." I don't think we have enough D6s for this. Let's go raid our Rifts box. Oh, yeah. that We, we went through, because we were early high school, and we went through all the Monopoly, all yep. the backgammon, any games that we all had, we'd have, we would just rob of D6s. And, and it's funny when it comes to D6 games, because when I was in high school, I loved Traveler. Traveler was straight yeah, up D6. My only issue was you couldn't level in it, but... And again, game within a game, character generation was a game within a game. However, I disliked greatly Tunnels and Trolls. Why? Because it was D6 based. They're both, they, 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 sure, they use their D6s differently, but they're both D6 based games. Now I am a, I'm an advocate for Tunnels and Trolls. I think it's a great system. Uh, works very well with small groups or a, as a one on one system, even solo. But uh, back then, I could not stomach it at all because I was comparing it straight up to D and D. Whereas Traveler, you compare Traveler to what Star Frontiers? Traveler, I, I thought was a better. I, I, you know, I couldn't take Star Frontiers seriously. I, I, I couldn't. Oh, we love Star Frontiers. We played a whole lot. In fact, we took uh, Expedition Bear Peaks and ran as a Star Frontiers game. All right, so Ian says he his group house ruled risk. <laughs> uh, you know what? And and we pulled out risk throughout my college days, my throughout my twenties. Risk came out if you had less than the full group of uh, five or six, if only four people showed up, risk. Uh, only three people showed up: uh, nuclear assault, uh, chaos marauders, a card game from Games Workshop that was just a blast to play, or talisman. You know, you, if you didn't have the full your full RPG group, it, it became uh, what's the alternate system that we can pull out? And and we had a lot. I mean, I still have closets full of, of board games that will never get played again, which is a shame. It's hard. Well, who knows? Maybe when things get towards retirement, maybe you can uh, find a community. Uh, gee, I, I, I am towards retirement. I am. Oh, that kind of retire. Like, yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah, like, like a term. retirement community. I'm like, I am retired. Oh, well, wait. you. The problem you, right you now 55 is and old community. we're on the cusp of a large group of people, gamers. Mm. Once, but you're not at the. Not a lot of us are at the ability or the time to retire. I think no, there's I a know. point where we will all be can be together in a retirement community, and we can just game all the time. 
And it's funny because um, my my mother's uh, cousin Carl. Uh, he, well, now he's he, he he's no longer in assisted living. Now now he's basically in a nursing home. But uh, when he was in assisted living, and my mother has power of attorney because he was losing it. But uh, I would go there with her, and I would look at their, you know, with the, watch, watch the folks playing cards, or whatever. I'm like, wow, I should volunteer to play D and D, run D and D with it for and like, uh, unless they've already played it in the past. I don't know how it's how easy it's going to be teaching people in their seventies and eighties to uh, play D and D, but you're right. As our group gets older, uh, that might be uh, certainly something to to look into. And we dealt out the territories, then dumped the mass of tokens on our one preferred location and went from there. Ah, uh, come on, risk. The whole secret to risk was Australia. It was well, maybe not. Australia was the way to make sure you weren't the first one killed, because uh, you could you could button up, but didn't mean you're going to win the game. <laughs> yeah. uh, but oh god, it's another game I probably haven't played in twenty years. My my set was the Caltrop set, but the uh, the single armies were were the three sided plastic Caltrops. Those things were horrible to step on barefoot. So. But yeah, well, actually, you know what, Jeff? Since we've we've delved off a little bit on this, so what were your go-to board games when you guys weren't doing a regular game? Uh, I think we mostly played, but I know there was a large stretch of. Um, I think we did some BattleTech. Uh, okay. X and Allies. Oh, uh, we never owned X and Allies and BattleTech. I had Battle Droids before they got sued. Yeah, and other than that, I think. There may be a few odds and ends, but for the most part in high school, it was mostly just D&D. Not D&D, but role-playing games. Right. Well, listen, in high school, D&D was synonymous with role-playing games, right? With, what are you going to play? Well, we're playing D&D. &D. Yeah, oh, cool. Play. Yeah, and you pick out your Traveler set. Yeah, we're playing, but that's Traveler. That's what you'd say now, right? It's like, are you playing Traveler? No, no, we're playing D&D. &D. It's like I'm using my Kleenex. Uh you know, it, it it was synonymous with you know RPGs. D and D was just the term. Yeah, and I think my group about the time I stopped playing as much, they went more heavily into BattleTech, and they even with X and Allies drew their own maps. And created, oh wow, like they created um, like rules for submarines where they'd be hidden, so they actually had a person kind of running the game, so they you could do hidden movement with your submarines. Now that is, is is once those war games got to the point where you needed a GM, you've come yeah. full circle. You know, uh, in a way, back to what you know war games started. But now, so this is how you got into the world of gaming, and this is what you did in the world of gaming. How did you get into the world of being a creative? Because, I mean, I know when I was nineteen, I was writing my own. Games they never got far, but I was writing my own like Dungeons and Dragons card game that I had planned out, and I had dreams of working for TSR. Then I fucking worked retail for eight years before becoming a cop. But um, how did you how did you become a creative? I mean that that that's a a turning of the switch, so to speak. Well, I think for me, um, I'm good at when well, I say good at I have a thing about mashing things together. Okay. So, and I don't think this is a, a virtue. I think it's more of a problem. But I'll see one game and I'll say, you know what? It'd be much, I think it'd be more fun to use a different system for this game and then try and mash it together. So, like, my worst attempt was Traveler. We played a lot of Traveler, but it just wasn't realistic enough. So, we took, I took Moral Project. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it's, it's terrible. <clears throat> it's a game I was... Together. My, my friend Paul, God rest him, he lost him on 9-11, but Paul gives me this box set. And I go, what's this? He goes, it's the Morrow Project. I'm like, okay. Because I've had it for years. I'm like, okay, I'm giving it to you. Why? I want you to run it. How much time do I have to prep? He goes, I don't know, a year or two? <laughs> You'll need that to understand the rules. I was like. Oh, yeah. So, yes. It was, it was a brutal, brutal game. Um 
but it's it's um, but anyway that so that was the start of it then the hero system you know okay basically anything you wanted to do you'd have to make right so if you want to do something out of the ordinary say you want to do a sci-fi or get a, a um a 30s action horror um then you'd have to create your own classes and 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 you know do those adjustments so that sort of has been the way i've been for a long time um but i think what really kind of changed more recently was on me we uh ray otis right was doing the doing these zines and what at that moment um i i never occurred to me before that i could actually put something in a booklet form oh yeah so before i would just do this mess in google docs it made no sense and they were just kind of scattered i just put notes and in for whatever reason at that moment i realized i can make documents because i find that a lot of uh, rpg materials adventures whatever they're not very gm friendly or you can buy a book like say whatever game book it is and you hand it to players who don't want to read it's not easy for them to make a character right you gotta go through like 50 pages like why is that why can't i just hand the players a little booklet they flip through it and go through and make their character and 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 reduce the amount of material they have to go through so once i understood that then all of a sudden it's like okay what else can i do so basically ray was your door opener that's you know that's yeah it, it really was i mean it, it's it sounds kind of dumb but it just sometimes you just it you just he wasn't necessarily doing that right just the idea of i can do it i just size booklet uh you know what I, I can understand that because like i i started out and uh, as an active creator or whatever you want to say in this hobby with my blog and that's because i saw what others were doing uh james mao rob conley uh joe the lawyers wondrous imaginings uh what was it uh jeff's game blog and i saw these and i was like wow this is like good shit, but it's also not necessarily refined shit. it was people putting out th their thoughts and it was you could you could taste the energy behind what they were putting out and i was like i i can probably do that but there were no uh there were no dumb you know blogging well there might have been a blogging for dummies book even at that point i i wouldn't know I, I i did my stuff uh by by trial and error at least back then but uh but i think even for you uh swords and wizardry light you said um that you wanted something stripped down and simplified, right? Yes. And oh. only because you listen, I, did you spend time away from the hobby? Yes. So did I. I spent uh, uh, spring of 97 through 2008, 2009 away from the hobby. I was still buying three ebooks, never played it, but I was buying the books. But I was away from the hobby. And when I came back, uh, it was overwhelming to return to something that even now I look at AD and D and go, wow, it was a it was a it was a it was a great mess. It was great, but it was a mess. And the new books were not a mess, but they were overwhelming. And I thought about that for the years after I came back and then I found Swords of Wizardry and, and Labyrinth Lord and all these games that rewrote the old stuff that we played, but better, so we could actually play it without having to go back and reread the same rules nine times to figure out what they meant. And when I retired, I was like, I wish there was a way to distill this down to, and this was my mindset, a guerrilla way of marketing RPGs. Get something on a single sheet of paper that you could leave at game stores or leave at libraries, maybe it's two-sided, and, and distill the core of an RPG down to that much that is still D and D at its heart, that it's still recognizable to old school gamers that have lapsed or left the hobby. Cause I met a lot of former gamers as a cop 
who left the hobby and didn't come back. And so that was my mindset. And I was talking about it with friends in the industry. And I talked about it with Zach Laser, who's at Frog God Games. And he was like, yeah, hold that thought. I go, wait a minute, hold that thought. I go, I got to make a phone call. He makes a phone call. He goes, well, if you could take Swords and Wizardry and, and bring it down to four pages, do you think you could do it? I go, I don't know. Well, he goes, well, you now have a mission, because if you can, we will publish it and distribute it for free in print. So you'll have your viral way of getting gaming into the hands of the masses. And I uh, got a copy of White Box on Lulu. That was somebody else other than Matt Finch's apparently Lulu account, because there's a reason why it was like, I don't know, $4 a book. Uh, and I went through it literally with a black marker marking out everything I thought was not needed. And I came out to about 10 pages. And then I had to still 10 pages down to, to four. And then to still them down further with the OGL. But uh, uh, the success of Swordsman Free Light is owed greatly to uh, Zach Laser. He laid it out and got it to fit and got it to be readable uh, on four pages. And uh, uh, none other than James Spahn, who uh, gave it a once-over and made some tweaks and suggestions that, that brought it to, I'll, I'll quote Spinal Tap, brought an otherwise excellent project to 11. But uh, yeah, I want something that my, my wife, she's legally blind, but she's a gamer now because of me. Something that she could learn the rules to and not have to refer to them. Or my niece, who's almost six, and it's like, Uncle, you wrote this? I'm like, yeah, now I can learn to play D&D. &D. You can teach me to read four pages. That was her goal to read. So yeah, that's that's that was my something simple that you can pick up and not spend a lot of time needing to learn. So, because we play a lot of different systems, and while I have the group I have, they're they're amazing people, but they don't they're not going to buy a book and read it. So, in a lot of ways, it, it's important for me that they be able to make a character. And if I just hand them a four hundred fifty page book, tell them to flip through it to make a character, oh god, it's overwhelming. Yeah. So, but but why for a game system? Why can't uh, the to me a lot of the publishers just create a booklet where it's just what you need to know to make that character with all the extra stuff stripped out. What do you really need to know to make a first level character? Right. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have to fall into that uh, 3X Pathfinder trap of uh, right. building out your Christmas tree character from levels one through 20, pre-planning out your feet. You should, characters should grow organically. That's really how they, they, Grew, I think when I was gaming, I didn't, I didn't plan anything out besides maybe what spell I was hoping to find for my next spell, you know, level for my magic user. That was that was it, you know. Or maybe I could find another cool magic item, but I wasn't worried about planning out. Well, if I don't get this feat at this level, I can't take this feat at this level, which means I can't take the advanced class. So let me plan all this out. That's and it turns into a counting RPG as opposed to a yeah, fantasy well, RPG. Yeah, and that's a that's a game, another game within a game, and that was based off of the the magic philosophy. Magic rewards research, and the more research you do, you can find flaws and exploit them. That's really what three point five was intended to do: is to the people who love Magic the Gathering are the same people who who are going to pour over those books to find all the ways to find combinations that will. Allowed to win, so to speak. Uh, that's an you know, I never actually thought about that connection because I was like, well, there's no connection between D and D and, and magic in, until they gave the magic setting to D and D. But the idea, the idea that you define the rules enough that you can find the flaws in the rules. That's it, that's the thing with. The older rules, they weren't defined to the point that you could find a lot of flaws. They just weren't. They, they weren't there because you had to invent rules. And if you did, they were rules that worked for your group and not necessarily for other groups, but then it wasn't a flaw. So there's a lot of people who just spent hours and hours and hours researching, reading, going to forums. So their form of enjoyment came from learning those rules and learning how to exploit them. 
So that was a reward for them. But for the rest of us, it's like, this is absurd. Yeah. I I, I never, it, it's funny with Pathfinder, it is a, it's a system that I'll admit, I initially was subscribed to the Paizo, I don't know, uh, publisher, published product of the month club, getting the latest stuff. But their adventure pass, which I never ran, were, were, were at least in the beginning when I was getting them, were well written. But I just you I would I would start reading them and figure after the second of the six part series, I was like I, I don't know if I'd ever keep a group together long enough playing one system scenario to finish it. There were very few campaigns. Most of our campaigns ended either in a total part of total party kill, TPK, or it ended with the you know what? I'm kind of bored with this. Let's go on to something else. So something like an adventure path that's, uh, you know, six issues of each of which is three or four sessions is probably longer than most of my, my gaming group campaigns were lasting back then. Ian wants to know what your position is in the gaming world. Well, well here, um, uh, you know, Jeff right now, he's the uh, layout artist for, uh, he did Torchlight, the premiere issue. He's uh, pretty much laid out issue one. The hold up there is is uh, me putting finalizing touches on and then getting to hands of our editor. And he's working on issue two, but he has his own project. So, since since Ian's getting impatient, Jeff, let's talk oh. about uh, your projects. So really, I decided, you know, going back to the um, the whole zine thing, um, I determined that I really want to get into publishing. I wanted to actually learn layout design, and I saw that the zine as being uh, an instrument for learning, and so so basically starting with Microsoft Word. In the beginning, I went and took um, the Caves of Chaos, split them all down to separate caves, kind of created my own little format. Uh, then I was playing some, uh, ran some Adventure Conquer King. Oh, nice. And so I made little booklets for that. And um, so every time I would, would um, every project I do, I try and learn something new. And so then played some, um, uh, some, uh, I forgot the name now, uh, Time Watch. Created some booklets for that. Kept okay. going. Then went to the Cephas engine and found out that is um, uh, that is a um, what we're looking for. We were allowed to make uh, use of creative. Oh, it's uh, community. Uh, yeah. Publisher. But, community. but yeah, it's the, where as long as you give the attribution, Creative Commons. So then I I thought, well, what if I was to strip the rules to such and uh, that I could make it into a moral project style game. But it'd be much simpler just using those rules. So then I went and stripped art from old army manuals, put it in there, stripped out all the spaceship rules, all those various rules, and just put just simply the stuff that you needed from a post apocalyptic game. And uh, that was um, also about last year. I determined, um, I don't know if people are familiar with Blades in the Dark, but um, I was very fascinated with Blades in the Dark, and it's a game that centers around crime, but it's set in a, like an apocalyptic kind of Elizabethan, it's not, it's hard to describe, but basically it's a very wonderful system. And I thought this could apply to a sci-fi system as well. And the idea okay. is like, have you played Shadowrun? Uh, I own the first edition and I own a later edition, but I can never get my group to play it. It is hard. I think you have games that do center around crime and you can buy adventures that are um, crime themed, but there's really not very many tools out there for running a game that is sandbox just around the theme of crime. Right. And so that's what uh, Blades in the Dark did, the idea of factions, your own crew, your relationship to other factions, uh, your the relationship to what's known as heat, the police coming to 
to create problems for you, um, interactions with NPCs, and rather than focusing on very specifics, uh, this kind of gave general tools for creating a crime game. So kind of taking a lot of those ideas, expounding on it, I decided to do uh, what ends up is now going to be called Scoundrels, which I'm planning on uh, uh, run through Zine Quest. So that's, that is one project that is actually um, pretty much done, just ready to, to pull the lever for, for Zine Quest. Um, but I've also done some stuff with the Cypher system, uh, tried writing some adventures. But what I found through this whole thing is my main thing is wanting to publish certain works, and one of these being Scoundrels. But the problem I've had is I've been a terrible Tom Sawyer. So I don't really write. I don't really do art. I don't do a lot of things. But I kept coming across these roadblocks where I, I needed these things done to have a finished project. So lately, I've been forced to, to write and to do various things. And so, um, but that's not the idea of state. So, um, but anyway, the point is right now, um, I've, I've got that. I've also had another uh, project I'm working on with some other people. Uh, we're going to be working on a Hyborian setting with, um, there's going to be the Zine format. And uh, we're going to focus on issues kind of regarding sandal and sorcery type games. Nice. So you got your fingers in a lot of pies. Yeah, I do. I'm still trying to figure out what it is, what is the right thing. I mean, ideally would be to find a group of people of other creatives where everybody kind of has their, their niche and made a little bit of overlap and just produce projects. That'd be my deal. Me just producing stuff on my own is, is okay, but that's not where I really want to be. Well, you know, I, I can uh, relate to that and understand that and there, it, it's weird because I like my blog's been in existence for uh, eleven plus years, I think, and it's something that is like it has been until this year totally my project. Occasionally, a guest post here or there, but it it was my baby. And and this year, I I actually gave away Sunday postings to uh, Chris Donkel, otherwise known as the uh, Frugal GM. He has a great blog. Uh, he's, he's a great resource if you uh, are looking for free or inexpensive uh, tools or resources for your gaming. And you know, when, when I was hospitalized in, in May, Chris stepped up to you know, basically uh, pitch in for me when uh, I, I, my, my luck was down. And it's something very f rewarding and freeing. Uh, initially, it was scary as fucking hell to take a project that is all yours and then allow somebody else to be a, a, a core part of it. And now that Chris is, I, I, can't, I, I can't see it any other way, really. Uh, I, I think it makes the, 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 the blog itself, the, the website itself, better having that additional voice you don't always oh hear me. definitely in fact that's that is true i mean the idea is i don't the problem is i don't think my ideas are always great ideas and i think that's the problem is that we um is that um you kind of need to bounce things off of people and then things are always stronger that way ah, i mean if there's nothing there's nothing harder than taking criticism on your your own work uh, until you've been criticized for 11 years and then you kind of realize it, it, it if you're not getting criticized it means that people don't care enough that you should improve and I tried to you know when, when I when I was working when I was uh, I was a supervisor for my last 14 of my 20 years there, there was something we used to uh, uh, say you know you you praise in public, you criticize in private. And I took that to heart. Although there are sometimes when you publicly criticize without naming names because you are giving a group lesson. But I, I never wanted to criticize without 
giving suggestions on how to improve, just telling people you're 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 shitty at what you do is is is, is not criticism. You know, it's it's certainly not constructive. You always you know want to uh, leave them with at least something that they, you know you can walk away with. So I I I know. Uh, I, I face a lot of criticism for the layout of uh, Swords and Wizardry Continual Light. Or maybe I shouldn't say, maybe not criticism. When, when I, I've been told that the layout was serviceable and and non-offensive. I don't know how non-offensive is a, is a term for a layout, but uh, I, 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 guess it, I guess it doesn't have much of a spark. Uh, I'll, I'll accept that. But... Uh, you know, you have to know bouncing ideas off each other and the synthesis of ideas is important as well, right? Yes. You know, and, and then part of it is, is, is knowing where your strengths lie. You know, if you don't know where your strengths lie, you'll never figure out where your weaknesses are. Uh, and uh, I, I realized that, you know, uh, one of my strengths is actually uh, cooperating or with other people. Uh, that is, is where... You know, the, the the sum is greater than the individual parts in every project that I've I've worked on with others. And so it's much really light. If it's something I did myself would would have been read by like ten people. It it really was uh, the amazing layout. Uh, it it was the tweaks that James came up with with and James is just if you've never uh, worked with James Bond and he's a good friend of mine. I consider him a brother. But uh, James is one of the most creative people I know and also one of the fastest creative people I know. So he is just amazing, amazing that aspect. And uh, and having a publisher like Front Guy Games that can say, hey, we're going to print 10,000 of these and give it away. Still blows my mind, sorry. But as again, if it was something that I was doing, my plan was that I could print on my home printer and fold in half and and drop off of the you know stack of the game store. That would never have had any impact. So yeah, I I, I do think, for the most part, for many of us, I, there are people who work better solo. Uh, I I I have seen that, but that's not me. That's for sure. Yeah, and it's also hard. I mean, there's not a lot of money in this industry, at least especially at the, the low level. Um, no. Because <laughs> so, it's, it's, uh, like with the zine, I thought, you know, I could pay somebody. I wrote an adventure. I'm like, you know what? I can just pay somebody to write these adventures. And I figured it'd be about 200 bucks if it's three cents a word. Uh -huh. And then I sell like four copies. I'm like, mm, this is not a money-making business. <laughs> And, and, well, and, and this is something that uh, you know should be discussed, and, and, and certainly we are discussing it. You you are not coming into if you come into this hobby with the idea of I'm going to quit my day job and this is going to be how I make my living. You are going to be sadly disappointed. Okay, have there been? Overnight successes in this hobby, yes, there have. Um, Zweihander is, is, is pretty much close to a, an overnight success, but you can be damn well sure that there was a shit ton of money invested in that project and not just invested in the project, in getting it known in social media and Daniel Fox himself to support it. Uh, there are people who can come into the hobby and throw dolls around and get themselves a presence known. And maybe if they're lucky, they will, with all that money spent, break even on their next project. The reality is, uh, and I mentioned this on uh, the podcast uh, actually last night, when I started this podcast, I, I had uh, uh, another well-known gaming podcast uh in this industry, I was I was talking to the people behind it at a convention, and I was saying, "Hey, you know, I've been doing this now for like a month or two, my own solo podcast, and I'm I'm really thrilled. I'm I'm getting like a hundred downloads at the time within like 24 hours." And they went, "Really?" I'm like, "Yeah." Well, you know, you are on Anchor, and Anchor is a built-in platform. And I went, "Yeah, like five percent of my hits are coming from Anchor." 
Well, hits weren't com they were coming from the blog that was established eight years prior because that's where I, I, I built the name for myself. Right. Um, and there are many ways to, to I don't say build up your notoriety, but to uh, build up an audience base. But the one thing that most people have an issue with is time. And and time is is really your your largest expenditure when it comes to that. And uh, our generation is a bit older. We're a bit better with 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 not needing instant gratification. But uh, and I know my son's not going to listen to this. So I'll throw him under the bus. Uh, last night I had a conversation with my son, and he's like going, "Oh, and I just, I, I sold a new Apple Watch." I'm like, "Really? Yeah, I, I think I could use it." Well, well, listen, put it on your Christmas list. I'm, you know, I'm happy to spend money on you for Christmas. And then an hour later, he's showing me a picture of a new Apple Watch on his wrist. And I'm like, dude. He goes, yeah, and I just realized I didn't make my car payment yet. Uh, I, I, I don't know what to fucking say. But that is, to some extent, the, the, the new generation. It's Listen, if you wanted something when we were growing up and you wanted to get it mail order, you mailed out your order Oh, in yeah. snail mail, and it came back postal three weeks later. You know, in my case, uh, paranoia without the fucking dice in the box. Right. Well, but, like like going back to comic books, right? Like, my, was it Mile High Comics? You you would put a oh, God. in for a catalog for all yes. like back issues, and then you get this printed out, typed up catalog. Yep. And then you would write a check. Which you had to mail back, mail and out. then, and then, and I think this happened to me because I ordered from Mile High, like I don't know, a handful of times. One time, I got a check back for two items that I wanted they didn't have in. Yeah. So they cashed my check and then refunded me via check. Yeah. <laughs> and you couldn't take, and of course that meant, that pissed me off because that meant I had to go go to the bank yeah. and deal with the teller and wait online because. You weren't going to be putting it into a cash machine. You weren't going to be taking a picture wow. of it. But uh, really, one of the hardest things when it comes to being a publisher is to get yourself known. Now, uh, again, going back to Zach Glazer, before he was Frog God Games, uh, he was lesser known publishing. And he came out with uh, Death and Taxes. Uh, he had a couple of great... Uh, Kickstarters that were boxed, and I didn't know Zach from a hole in the wall, but I, I I saw his Kickstarter and it was amazing. And a box set Kickstarter, who, who the hell does box? Who's Spurn Venom was his first one. Who does a box set Kickstarter? So I happened to post about it on on the tavern, and uh, Zach reached out to me at the end of the Kickstarter and he said, "Do you realize that?" And he he. he, he was well funded because thirty percent of my backers came from the tavern. I'm like, no oh shit, really? He goes thirty percent. You know that's that's because. And it, so what I'm saying is, if you places like N World, Ten Cars Tavern, uh, other blogs, other news sites, they do have a purpose not just beyond, you know, reading about latest releases and, and gossip and whatever, but it allows you uh, as a consumer, but also you as a publisher to use a, a, a platform, even if you're not actively using it, even if they just happen to post about you, that gets you, gets you, you, you known. I, I'll be honest, Jeff, you know, I don't play Cortex. So I would never have looked for uh, a product that has, Cortex is a rule system. I don't know what blogs or websites cover it, but those are areas where if you're going to market um, a zine that uh, you probably have to find and cover. I do get people reaching out to me weekly, actually more than weekly. I've got a new uh, project. I've got a Kickstarter coming up. They let me, they let me know because, and I consider myself a news site of sorts, for OSR gaming, but I am not. I'm, uh, I'm not. I'm not God. I'm not the you know, all knowing. Right. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we, we need a little guidance as to to what is out there. But in the case of me, 
I, I love sharing out new shit that the community is creating. And, yeah, and I think uh, your strength is you found like the OSR, and that's probably been the your your main, I'll say your main love and yeah. the market. My problem is I am like all over the map of things that interest me. So <laughs> well, listen, when the ta when the tavern started out. Uh, if you go back and, and I don't recommend this to anybody because my the first year of posting was really shit, but I was covering Amazon Kindle. I was covering VTTs. I was covering the OSR. I was covering weird indie press games. I was all over and I still stray on occasion, but I've got my focus, but my focus is what I truly in, enjoy. And I, I'd like to think I'm knowledgeable about, but I tried when I retired, I tried doing like a, a blog on beer. So I happen to be a fine enjoyer of beer, a consumer. And I've done some, how you know, home brewing of beer, but uh, wasn't very successful, but not only because I wasn't, I, I, I took me, uh, take me a while to establish an audience. Because I wasn't all that knowledgeable. I could enjoy it, but I didn't have the knowledge that I was imparting or I wasn't an authoritative voice on on beer. I was the guy who goes, yeah, Blue Moon's – oh, what do you mean Blue Moon is mass-produced? I thought it was – oh, shit. Uh, you know, that kind of yeah. – yeah, you know, I was like, oh, okay. So that that, that pretty much came and, came and went. But, uh, yeah, finding – and part of the process is finding what what speaks to you. I mean, I've having having uh, known you now for about half a year or so. Uh, I I know that you are an avid gamer. I know that you have a, a joy for creation, and 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 that'll that that will definitely speak. But don't hesitate, and uh, whether it comes to me and my various media streams or any other place that you think that would be a good place to show off your work, to use them. That's what they're there for. You're not just, you know, I, I had somebody guiltily go, I have a new Kickstarter and I really don't know if I should show it to you. Go, if you don't, then there's a community of gamers that will not see it. Yeah, that's fair. And I absolutely do appreciate that. But I think there's some things um, I have done or I am going to do that are definitely very strongly related to the OSR or like with Scoundrels when it uh, goes to Z. Oh, definitely. Class. That system, that's that's a systemless thing. It's It can be used for really any modern or science fiction game. Or you can even use it even for even some fantasy to a certain degree. But it's, um, but that's just definitely the, um, it, it's, it's, I think eventually I'll find things that, you know, to make my mark. But for now, I'm just kind of experimenting. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> but for me, just experimenting, uh, see what works and what doesn't. Uh, and oh yeah, that's been. It, it's also, I mean, whenever. So until you're actually on the other side of drive through RPG, you don't really understand what's going on on that. Oh God, I had I before I did. I'd be like. Uh, and I, I would be, I would participate in conversations with publishers about the medals and what they meant, and trying to figure out and parse the stuff. And then I started putting out little pay what you want products, and got that peak on the other side, that publisher side. And I was like, "This is science to this." And the science changes, by the way, folks. They've changed how they. They they do their their metal rating. Uh, when I first started, it was pay what you want sales that were zero, still counted as a sale towards your metal rating. Doesn't doesn't work that way anymore. It has no, to it be. Doesn't. So they've 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 changed that, and I think they changed it retroactively. So Source of Wizardry Continual Light kept its ranking, which I Electrum. Silver? Not sure. But it it slid within the ranking because a lot of those sales were pay what you want that people paid nothing. But it was pay what you want for a while. But uh, it's very interesting to see 
price points. I think, I know we, we discussed this offline, but people like Phil Reed and how he prices his Kickstarter releases, he's found a secret sauce that works very well for him when it comes to price point and backer numbers and uh, totals for a project. It, it's simply amazing. Oh, it is. He's definitely puts out great product at a great price and has found and has built up an audience. It's interesting. If you look at like his history of Kickstarters and the products that he's produced. I've been, I think I've backed every Kickstarter he's produced. It's like all sorts of different things, but what he's yep. done is he's just pr has a name for producing good quality work. And it could be, could be just a, a book of, uh of hexes for mapping it could just be that you know yeah. but he will but he puts out good work built up a name over time he's actually produced but it's taken a long time for him to get to this point well and and and, and that's the, the whole thing you don't you don't jump into the pool into the deep water and expect to suddenly learn how to swim no you know oh. the, the, the lucky people get away with the dog paddle but everybody else has to start in the uh the shallow end and and learn right and there's no there's no i mean until you do it you really don't know no yeah no you don't and and there's this and the science behind kickstarter doesn't necessarily apply to a place like drive through which doesn't necessarily apply to the dm's guild and other community uh programs on uh on, on the drive through one the one bookshelf uh banner they, they are different marketplaces. There's uh, different, I don't want to say different science behind it, but there's definitely d different motivations and moving factors for how all that stuff puts to place together. It's, it's yeah, an interesting. Like, thing. Yeah. And so people wanting to, I mean, to put out product and especially if you drive through it's the way you're, you're going to have to work hard to actually get to the point where it actually is going to make it for you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, what is that saying that you how do you how do you make uh, ten thousand dollars in the RPG industry? Spend twenty. Yeah, yeah. Spend twenty k to make ten. Um, you you look at your successful uh, third tier gaming company. You look at Goodman Games. You look at Troll Lord Games. You look at Frog God Games. The successful companies in the OSR, they've all been doing this now for 10 plus years. And they are where they are now because they put the time in earlier. Yep. You know, you, 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 yeah, the idea of hitting the ground, when people go, oh, well, so and so hit the ground running. Well, you know what? So and so did not hit the ground running. They may have hit the ground running in a new market. Or a new way of reaching out to their audience, but like I said, when this podcast hit the ground running, it hit the ground running because Tank Cars Tavern was around for nearly a decade prior, right. building a community, and uh, you know, it's a Discord server. Tank Cars Tavern Discord server has over twenty two hundred people in it, which is great. And <clears throat> we had over five hundred in the first week when I created it. They didn't come out of nowhere; they came out of the established community if i had just started and had no presence it would still be there with no presence you know and it's just that you can there are there are ways like i said to leverage media in your corner of the universe uh even as a new blogger i quickly learned that if i wanted to get known as a as a blogger with my own blog you participate in other people's blogs you make useful comments you make useful comments on forums. Um, I, I don't know how useful forums are these days, and blogs are losing a lot of their relevance compared to 10 years ago. But, uh, you know, Facebook, MeWe, uh, if you are active and you make comments or you're, you're giving commentary that is useful, not simply... Uh, something that people are going to respond to and go, oh, fuck you, but actually useful, um, you will 
build up a group of people that will then go, oh, look, Jeff has produced XYZ. I, I, I think I'll check it out. Well, and I think that's the thing is whatever a person wants to be successful in, uh, let's say you want to be a successful photographer, commercial photographer, or portrait photographer. Right. You think it's all about learning photography, but that's actually probably the smallest part. Marketing, business, yep. those types of things play more important role than the actual photography does. And the same thing with your product. You can make the greatest product in the world, but if you're not marketing it, it doesn't look right, whatever it may be, it will remain unknown. Yeah. And and that is an important thing for uh, I, I, any generation. Like I said, I, I know people have, and I can't say our generation since we do share the same date of birth, but our generation, I still know people from our generation that are like, yeah, but, you know, I, I'm not going to say who, I started a podcast. How come I can't get more than, than 20 listeners? Um, what are you doing to get the word out? Oh, yeah. It, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's also putting yourself out, you know, sometimes there are, it feels emotionally risky to do that as well. Oh God, yeah. I, uh, b believe it or not, uh, I, I would be considered a shy person. Doesn't seem like it, but uh, I was shy through school. Uh, worked retail. Like I, I got a position in electronics, which is a non-shy position. But my manager that hired me told me, "You're a shy person, but I think we can get past that." I was like. And then I became a cop, which doesn't allow you to be shy. And my 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 whole uh, my whole crutch when I was a cop, if in doubt, role play a cop. If I don't know what to do, I'm gonna I'm gonna fall back on my role playing experience and fake it. Fake it till you make it. There, and that that was it. So my me doing a daily podcast, uh, believe it or not, I'm, I'm I'm kicking that shyness in the ass, I guess. But it, it's still there. Yeah, I, I can I can talk with you, Jeff, and have a great time doing this. If I had a cold call you on a on a phone call, <sighs> do I really need to do this? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we can we can we can do a, a podcast and pretend it's like hanging out at a bar, and and, and it's fine. It's psychological too. It and then that's no sense, does it? No, it doesn't. But that's something else. When it comes to uh, getting yourself known, you got to. You got to lie to yourself sometimes, and maybe that lying to yourself is telling yourself, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna post about my new release on, uh, on on Facebook, and I'm not gonna be embarrassed or feel guilty about doing so because I think that the work is good, but I could have done better. You know what? You could always do better. Uh, oh, yeah. And I am friends with many creators in this hobby or this industry, depending on which level you want to take it to. And uh, uh, many of them have that feeling of, uh, although I've worked for major companies and I've got this great stuff published, on, I'm still a failure. I'm still a fraud. And somebody's going to read my work and go, what kind of a hack put this out? Oh, well, yeah. You know what? Your, your biggest critic, as well as your biggest praise is going to come from yourself and uh listen to your criticism or listen to your to your praise and somewhere in between maybe you have the truth about what you wrote or what you're putting out maybe but uh unless you put it out there and, and now i'm going to quote from my college creative writing professor uh if you are writing creating only for your own pleasure, it is mental masturbation. It serves no purpose other than that. You have to put your work out there to be critiqued, to be criticized, uh, to be loathed, to be loved. And he goes, that's what creativity is about. And he goes, but if you're just doing it for your, for your own gratification, he goes, I'll, I'll hand you a porno mag and, and, and leave my classroom. <laughs> That then again, he's the same one that gave us a wine and pot potty on Queens College lawn. So I mean, for uh, celebrate the to celebrate the last day of class, 
we're going to read our stories, uh, pass around the doobie, and uh, drink some wine. I was like, I'll pass on the doobie, but I'll take the wine. <laughs> this is a this is my kind of college. Jeez, and it's a commuter <laughs> college. Nice. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure they do worse on college these days. But, uh, you know, Jeff, this has been this has been good, man. This is I, I told you beforehand that this is a very relaxed type of I don't want to call it an interview, but it's a really relaxed hangout, a chat. Oh yeah. So now you're gonna before we uh, uh, close the door on today, you got a new podcast coming out that you've got in the works. Yeah, it's called RPG Ramblings, and I know people are thinking, "What? We need another RPG podcast?" Yes, we do. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. We'll find out. No, no, <laughs> before we go any further, you do because I'm going to tell you why. Um, not. Every there are some really good podcasts out there that get all these fucking awards, and I'm not going to name like Ken and Robin. I'm not going to name them. I, I just did, but uh, some of them are very scripted, but they are very well produced. And then you got some that aren't scripted and are produced like shit. Yours truly, um, but I think that it, those two extremes and everything in between has an audience to be found, and it isn't like. There's a limited number of listeners. And a new podcast is going to steal listeners from somebody else. Right. No, if you yeah. if you're going to stop listening to one podcast to listen to another, guess what? You were going to stop listening to that podcast to go read a book anyway. That's just what yeah. it comes down. To. Where, I, where I plan to do, I think, probably a little bit different is I think there's just a lot of details in RPG creativity and production. And uh, just kind of want to cover some more, I guess, how the sausage is made, so to speak. Oh. You know, that is certainly good, and I think that uh, you know a large number of people now, you know, especially through uh, the Facebook zine community that uh, Tim has put together that a lot of creatives hang out there and interact on. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely amazing. I would say that is probably one of the greatest communities that I've been a part of as far as just people putting stuff out, people being supportive. I, don't, I haven't seen any negativity in that. No, it, it's really good, and I think it's hilarious that for years uh, Tim could could not get onto Facebook. His account was like totally corrupted, and he couldn't get it reset. And uh, it was like being in Facebook jail for no reason whatsoever. And he'd be like, "I hate fucking Facebook." And now that he got it working, and this is the community that he comes up with, and it, it was like, you know what? Yes, you spent years not being able to use Facebook, but once he could, uh, the time was well spent where he wasn't there because he came out and, and he gave us one of the, the best Facebook communities that I've, I've really seen. Not, as, not just is there no negativity, it is such a resource for anybody who not just wants to publish zines, but to publish. Right. Yeah, you just put something out and say, what do you guys think? And some will say, you know what, I think you probably ought to do this or this. And the people that are telling you this are a lot of times people that are professionals. Yes. I can and that by the, by the response. It's like, this is a person who just gave me a critique, and I can tell exactly by the response, they know what they're talking about. Right. And, and they're not telling me, it's like, oh, I want to screw Jeff up. I'm going to I'm gonna give him a critique that's going to, because I don't want competition. No, these are, people fail to understand that uh, this is an industry where, honest to God, 99.8% of the people in this in the, in the industry aren't just publishers that are publishers. They are fans, they are gamers, they are consumers, and they are members of this community, and they want others to succeed. And it really is an amazing thing to see the generosity of, of, of their time when it comes to that. Really. Well, and, and right, so even like the people that are professionals, like there was a person, any uh, award-winning um, content creator who I just asked, and he's very busy, very, very, very busy with life and everything. I just asked him, hey, do you know of any proofreaders? And he's like, well, just send it to me. He proofread it. Really? And then gave me some very solid critiques. And I'm just thinking that is the absolutely, I mean, tremendous generosity. You know what I mean? It's just, right. 
I think our industry is so small that that we kind of look at, you know, we kind of elevate people, but they're gamers like us. We're all in the hobby because we love doing it. Even if you're successful and doing things and running a company or whatever, in the end, we want the community to thrive and to succeed, and we want people to do well, and we want yes. to share our love for the hobby. And so I think in general, it's it's pretty amazing how generous people are willing to be. No, you ain't kidding, man. This is really, uh, it's, uh, how, how can I put it best? I spent, I, I spent 20 years in law enforcement and the, you know, law enforcement is one large community, not just throughout the nation, throughout the world. You can go anywhere and, uh, at least be able to get in the front door and 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 shake a few hands with people that are in law enforcement anywhere else. And gamers, especially within the OSR, are in many ways even more welcoming than that. It is such a a beautiful thing to see, and I'm such a great thing to be a part of. I I, I couldn't be happier, honestly. So the other thing that kind of hit me. Uh one time at Game Hole Con was just how democratic uh, RPGs are. If you go to a convention and you sit at a table, you could be sitting next to a scientist, the next to oh, yeah. a banker, police officer could be running the game, and a guy that delivers uh, uh, water filtration systems. All sitting at the same table, enjoying the company, even though politically could be wide differences in, in beliefs and passions. But yet we're all able to come together and enjoy each other's company. Yeah, we, we you know, I, I'm a huge believer uh, that we should share and stress that which we have in common and 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 leave behind that which divides us, especially within gaming. You know, I, I want to have a good experience at my game table. I don't, if I, if I want the drama of politics, believe me, I can I can find it with that much effort. I want a game at the game table. I want a game in my gaming communities. I want to talk about nerd shit right. and uh, geek shit and gaming. And that's, and that's, you know, what I love is that for the vast majority of gamers, they are on the same track. And, and the, the, there are some that aren't, but, you know, that's their business. I'm not going to begrudge them that, you know, but when we sit down to game, you know, it, it, was that rule at, at the holidays uh, for uh, dinners? No yeah. politics and no religion at the table? Yeah. You know, it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah, in my weekly gaming group, it's uh, myself and another guy named James, who's a, a, a veteran, are probably the oldest, but we have the vast majority of people younger than us, and a lot of times female. So it's just like we would never associate any other time. We don't. But the idea that we can come together and game is really pretty amazing. Yeah. And I think it's probably one of the most positive social things that can happen uh, in a community. Definitely. And, and, and people uh, you know, poo poo that, or I, I've heard the uh, uh, the OSR is not a community, it's a, it's a method to publishing. No, but the people that form a community around the OSR. Are certainly a community. Uh, I, I I understand the arguments against it. I just uh, I don't believe I I I don't follow the logic. You know. Or even even like why does it even matter? Like why even bring it? Right. Up? Yeah. Well, it's because. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I don't want to be part of your community. Then don't be. Exactly. Yeah. Nobody. You know, we're not going around saying you must wear the the badge of the OSR. No, you don't have to do anything. But you are you a gamer? Yeah. Do you like OSR games? Yeah. Well, you know what? The people within the community are going to probably say, "Hey, we got things in common." Right. You know. Wow. Well, Jeff, thank you, man. Now, is there any place that you know folks can find uh, you or your products at? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I am I do sell products on itch.io under I think it's Jeffrey Jones. Okay. Uh, Jones and Four Games with the number four I think is my storefront on Drive Through RPG. Um, Twitter I don't 
tweet much, but it is yeah. I underscore am underscore Jeffrey. And other than that, um, it's probably in Facebook uh, if you're on an RPG uh, uh, zine. Oh, also, I'm doing, uh, I started an RPG uh, uh, ramblings uh, Facebook group. So. Oh, nice. Okay. So that would work too. So, um, but um, yeah, however you find it, it's fine. And if anybody wants any help looking for um, layout design, that's kind of the jam that I'm working on now. And uh, just let me know. We can look at uh, Torchlight, the premiere issue, if you want to see what uh, work Jeff has done. Yeah, and itch.io. There's a lot of examples on itch.io and drive through. Um, so I, I think I've put out about eight products of my own since July. And I think two nice. and two torch lights by by the end of the year. So, so each one gets better. So, and also products I do, I'll go back and and uh, as I get funds, I'll go back and <laughs> put art into it or uh, oh, improvements as I go. Well, Jeff, thank you for uh, spending the time. Like, it, it, it's our first time actually getting a chance to do more than uh, Facebook chat with each other. So this was good. Yeah, it's been amazing. I really appreciate it, Eric. It's been a great oh, time. Thank you. And uh, when your podcast goes uh, live and, and, and hits the interwebs, I'll make sure I, I, I mention it here and at the tavern. Okay. So uh, people, people should go because Jeff's going to have a nice list of guests. Uh, so. Yes. So there's a lot of very interesting people doing very interesting things from all sorts of places. So it should be – I'm really looking forward to this. Well, as am I. Because I always like a good podcast and – I don't listen as much as I used to now that I don't commute to work, but I still find time. So, awesome. Well, again, Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, everybody else, world of COVID, use your common sense. Can't stress that enough. Uh, be safe, be well. God bless. Roll those dice. And God willing, I will talk with you all tomorrow. Thanks to all our live listeners. It's been fun. Laters.